Every one of you a very warm welcome here this morning. I also want to welcome the Reverend Ivan Patterson here today. Ivan is taking our service as Chris is on annual leave. Ivan, thank you for coming. We really appreciate that and look forward to you leading our service and teaching us from God's word. And Chris will be back with us in this incoming week. And uh, we have set up tea and coffee in the foyer as we come in. Uh, the painters are still working in the main hall, but hopefully next Sunday we'll be back into the main hall again for tea and coffee. Uh, I will now hand over to Ivan. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for, for the welcome. It's good to, to be here in Greystone Road. I think this is probably the shortest distance I've had to travel since I retired to take a service. But I did come by car, mind you. I thought if I came other ways, I would uh, be out of breath or something at my age, you know. But I thank your minister, too, for, for asking me. It's a joy to know Chris. I've known him for quite a wee while now, and I'm very happy to have his friendship renewed as he's working here in Greystone Road. And I trust that together this morning we will know something of the encouragement, maybe even the challenge, uh, and the blessing of Almighty God. In the book of Hebrews, we read these words. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And we pray he will indeed speak to us in our worship today. Let's pray together. Almighty and eternal God, we come to worship you, to hear your word, to confess our sins, and to behold your glory. As you are lifted up among us in praise and prayer, and through your word, may we be like Isaiah to be able to cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so may our whole beings be moved by the glory of your love as we have experienced it in Jesus Christ. And may we leave here blessed, determined to be a blessing to others and filled to overflowing with your spirit. And to you then we give all the honour and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing, come people of the risen King.
Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we come to celebrate you, your greatness, your power, power that created the universe, all that sustains our lives and directs the very course of history. We come to celebrate your goodness, your love revealed in Christ that reaches out in forgiveness and fills our minds with gratitude. We come to celebrate your faithfulness, your covenant made with your people, affirmed through Jesus Christ and made new every day. We come to celebrate life, life in all its fullness, faith in all its richness, filled with promise, offering us fellowship with you, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so, Almighty God, we bless you beyond our deserving, filling our lives with good things and reminding us of the richness of your grace and offering us forgiveness and new life. As always, Father, we remember the need of your forgiveness, for we know that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And yet if we confess, you forgive us, you cleanse us. And again, we seek your pardon, acknowledging our faults, our weaknesses, our unworthy actions, our ugly thoughts. Despite our best intentions, we failed. Our hearts have been fickle. Our faith has been flawed. Our spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And so we come in humility and we acknowledge that we need to confess. We thank you that you forgive us. You renew us. And in Christ's name, you open up the way into your very heart. And so we come. Take the worship that we bring and bless our lives as your spirit moves among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's good that we come to a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. A God who is swift to pardon and who forgives the repentant. God's word says this, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Great words as we come seeking forgiveness and opening up our hearts to the mercy and love of God. Let me read Psalm 23 to you at this stage. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we thank God for his promises given to us. Young folk, I told you I'll come to the front, so come down and I'll have a chat with you as I switch myself on. Good morning. Are you all well? Are you missing school? You're not? Oh my goodness, not, mu mu not much time left yet. Of the holidays, you'll be going back and you'll be so overjoyed to get back and do all your lessons. But you have a few wee bits of time, a, a little bit of time left before, before you go back. Do you like shoes? You do? I brought some shoes with me. 
there's a pair of those. Then there's a pair of, oh, there's only one. Get this one to come out. And there's that one. You can see that, uh, what's that one for? Running. Running or something. You can see I don't run very much. <laughs> Do you think that's mine? <laughs> you don't know. No, shoes are important. That you've all got lovely shoes on there this morning. And of course, there's other shoes like these ones that I've got on. These are kind of more formal shoes. But we have trainers and we have women's shoes uh, and we have other sort of flip-flop things, haven't we? Shoes. Do you like your shoes? Or does your parents buy these shoes even though you don't like them? They do. <laughs> See, that's what parents do. They, they, they don't always listen to what we're thinking about or what, what we want. Why on earth do you think I'm talking about shoes? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. Shoes are important because people even older than I am, much older than I am, tell, told me that when they went to school, they walked to school on the bare feet and they carried their shoes or their boots. They put them on before they went into school because they had much money and they had to look after their shoes. Now, we pretty much, it wouldn't be great if you had to go on the bare feet to school. You wouldn't like it very much, would you? But shoes are all, tell me this, when you go into the house, do you take your shoes off? Who takes their shoes off? I don't. Yeah, many people take their shoes off, just so that the muck is, sometimes I do when I remember, but sometimes people take their shoes off so they don't take the muck in. But you know, some places in the world, you take your shoes off, you must take your shoes off before you go into the house, because it's a sign of respect. You take your shoes off, you don't have to take your socks off unless you have sandals, then you, don't, you go in with the shoes off. It's a sign of respect. And when we went through to Nepal and India on one occasion to do some work, and we were told all the things we had to do about our shoes, take them off, and when you're sitting on a seat, don't point your toes at anybody. They don't like it. It's rude. So there are all kinds of different cultures about shoes. But I'm talking to you about shoes, about taking off our shoes. Because later in the service, we're going to talk about a man called Moses. Do you remember him in the Old Testament? He was born and put into an ark of bulrushes, and he was found by Pharaoh's daughter, and all of that sort of stuff. But one day he was out looking after the sheep of his father-in-law, and he was amazed, really amazed, because there were lots, weren't many trees about, but there was one tree, and he looked at it because it was on fire. Like we've seen on the news these last while, lots of fires in Europe, lots of fires all over the place, and latterly in Hawaii, fires burning. But this was a bush that was burning. And he thought to himself, what on earth is that all about? But he said, I better go and see. So he made his way over to the bush. And when he got there, he heard a voice. Moses, take off your shoes because the place where you are standing is holy ground. That was to be a very important moment in Moses' life, because that was God speaking to him from the bush. The fire got his attention, because when it was burning, it didn't, the tree didn't go away, it just burned. But it was an important moment for Moses, because there he met God. And God said to him, Moses, take off your shoes because the place where you are standing is holy ground. It was a sense in which Moses was to acknowledge that God was someone very, very important. And then he heard the voice, Moses, I have a job for you to do. And then he told him all about his, the people that Moses was from because he had left Egypt and the people were there. And it was a rough time for them in Egypt. They were called slaves. Nobody was really caring for them. And he said, Moses, you've got to go back there and bring your people out of Egypt. He was called by God to go and do a very important job. He wasn't too keen to do that, but he says, God, I, I'm not up to this. I, I, I don't speak very well. But anyway, as it turned out, he went and he saw, he heard God's voice, he took off his shoes, and God said to him in another sense, Moses, now that you acknowledge me as God, put your shoes on again, because you're going 
to Egypt to set my people free. And if you know the story, that's what happened. Moses went and he led eventually his people out of Egypt and their slavery to the promised land. But here's the point. Not really about shoes. The point is this. The most important voice you will ever hear in your life is God, is Jesus. Oh, there'll be lots of other voices you will hear at school, at home, when you're told to do things and you don't want to do them. But the most important voice you will hear is that of God. And God, as I read at the beginning, speaks to us today through Jesus. And he tells us how much he loves us. And how much he wants us to be his friends. And in a way, he tells us to take off our shoes as a sign of respect that here is the God that we love, that we need to give our lives to. And then he says to us, put those shoes back on again and go and be my servants at school. When you grow up and go to work, get married or whatever happens to you, you go and take the love of Jesus with you. Because he comes to fill our hearts with his love and forgiveness. And he asks us to live that way each and every day. So remember the shoes and Moses. Take them off, put them on. But remember above all that God speaks to us as God spoke to him. And he calls us to follow him. And he calls us because when we follow him, that's how life is at its best. And not only life, but he promises that he will never leave us ever again. I'm going to sing. I think it is, Lord, I lift my name on high. Are there actions to this? No. I don't know them, but if anybody does, you're free to do it. Let's stand and praise God. Lord, I lift your name on high. I were to ask you what people like Moses and Elijah, maybe even Jonah, have in common. I'm not sure what you would answer, but they are all men who were on the run. Moses was running away from Egypt after a very unfortunate incident. Elijah running away from Ahab for fear of his life. And then there's Jonah. Jonah was just running away from himself. And it's interesting, if you read those stories, to discover how it was that God got their attention. Remember Elijah? He's in the middle of a tornado. He's attuned to hear God's voice, but he doesn't hear it in the big, loud noise. He hears it in that still, small voice. In the quietness he heard when he expected something more dramatic. 
And Jonah, remember him exhausted, sitting in the shade of a tree, feeling it would be better to die than to go on. And he hears God speaking and is challenged about his sectarianism and challenged to see people, even those people that he thought were useless and hopeless. And then Moses, as we're going to look at today, through a burning bush is made to take time to wonder and to discover with God's help what he can achieve more than he ever thought possible. People who were all running away from God and it, to some extent running away from the responsibilities of life. And as we look at these men, we, we can all realize that maybe in some ways we are all on the run. And yet we can run away from many things, but we can run away from the very thing that will complete your life. We run away because we won't decide about something. We won't sort something out. Worst of all, we can be people who run away from God. The one who in Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. For he loved the world so much that he gave us Jesus that we might believe and not perish. Of course, in worship, as we meet each Sunday, the real, the real place, the proper place for us to run is into the very arms of God who loves us and he has given his son for us. But it's easy, as I've said, to run from situations. But running can never sort, at least in my life, running can never sort the problem out. Sometimes you just need to stop and think and work it out. Today we're going to read in a moment from Exodus 3. We look at the story of Moses, the burning bush, so much part of the symbol of Presbyterianism. But it's what happens, I believe, when we take time, as Moses did, just to, to observe, to look, to have eyes that see, because sometimes we have eyes that don't really see. And we need to reflect on God's purpose for our lives. I suspect and I hope this morning that we can turn aside. We can look beyond the immediate, beyond ourselves, to bring hope to our own lives, to bring hope through our, own, our living, to bring hope to a struggling world. Because as God calls Moses or any of the others we've mentioned, he calls each of us to turn aside, to orientate our lives into God's plan and purpose. We read from Exodus 3. We're going to read verses 1 through to 15. Moses and the burning bush. We hear God's word. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So he thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because they are slaves, because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But 
Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God said, also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. And we end our reading there and pray that God will bless to us and to our understanding this his word. But to pray again, just bring various needs before God into his gracious keeping. We'll pray for the church in general, the Presbyterian and others, and for our own selves here in Greystone Road. I always like to bring before God the whole situation, political in Westminster, in Stormont, in Europe, in Ukraine. I think it's good to pray for our homes. Everyone has different experience of, of home, some good, some not so good. So we'll pray for our homes. And we remember the Wilson family as they will come back to work. We pray that they will be really refreshed. We think of those in Europe and all the fires that have been, and now latterly in Hawaii. And of course, let's just remember the things that are heavily on our own hearts. So let's join together and let us pray. Father God, we come in faith and hope. We come running to meet you. As we acknowledge your presence among us, that our minds and our hearts be filled with stillness as we pray that you will come to me, that God will come to us and that we will go to him in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who came that we might have life, and have it to the full. We pray for and give thanks for the church of Jesus Christ in its many forms and gatherings, that in our ministries together we may serve you faithfully, Father, that we will be those who will champion the cause of Jesus, enabling all into a deeper understanding of who you are, of hearing your voice, and of being lights to our communities and to our world. We pray for all those who serve us in many ways in local government, whether that's Stormont or Westminster. We pray that a spirit of integrity may underline all discussions and activities, and that a desire for goodness may inspire all the decisions that are made, whether that's locally, nationally, or in those situations where there is war, particularly in Ukraine, we long, Father, that you would bring peace, not only to Europe or that part of Europe, but to our world. We thank you to our Father for our families, for all that our families mean to us, our homes. We thank you when our homes are a real blessing but we realize that not all are, and we remember those who have difficult experiences at home. Father, we pray that those who are going through difficulties may not be damaged through their sufferings or their distress. We pray that in our homes that there will be a continual growth in compassion and understanding. Pray for mums and dads and our children. Help them to enjoy the rest of the holiday but encourage them in the way ahead. And through the witness of the church and indeed of families, may they be confronted with the love of Jesus Christ. 
We give thanks for the ministry here, for Chris Wilson, for his wife and children. We thank you for the time they're having of refreshment, and we pray that they will come back refreshed to serve you with the people here. Father, we think of those who are in pain and distress, whether it's because of fires in Europe or Hawaii. We pray for aid to be brought to those people. We think of those who may have recently been, be, have been bereaved, many who are long-term ill. Think of people who are mentally and physically and emotionally disabled. Bring them your comfort and strengthen them by your presence. Enable them to trust in your love, which never fails. Father, we remember our own needs. Because as we come to remember others, you know what's heavily upon our own hearts and what you need to do to us and for us today. So hear us in a moment's quietness as we bring our own prayers to you. Father, Elijah heard you in that still, small voice. May your voice be audible and still and affirming and saving as we wait upon you, giving thanks for the many blessings you give us each day, praying that you will help us to ever embrace all that you have offered to us in the gospel, and that by your Holy Spirit, you will inspire us so to live and to live well, living in your presence. And to you, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, let's give all the honor and the glory and the praise this day and always. Amen. We sing again the praises, Holy Spirit.
Let's just be still for a moment. Father, may we see you clearly. And may others see you clearly in us. And we pray that all that we do now as we listen, as we speak, that above all we will hear your voice so that we can turn to you and embrace everything that you have for us. Amen. Now, I have no idea how God got your attention. I trust he has got your attention and I trust that he is in your life and has changed it. But I suspect he got your attention and it wasn't through a burning bush. We're going to look at Moses on the run and God gets his attention through the bush and turns his life around. It's quite dramatic. I want to look at how it happens and for your comfort and length of sermon, can I tell you there are six points? That's two good sermons of three points each. We'll see how it goes. I don't think you'll have to worry. The first thing we discover as we read through this passage is that Moses turns to see. Now, it's little wonder that this type of burning bush gets his attention, particularly because it burned but did not disintegrate. And he has to go to see what's going on. So he turns to see And he discovers something very special. He meets God in a particular way. And his life is completely reorientated. He turned from running to responding. It's a kind of a conversion experience. He turns to see and he's never the same again. It's interesting that turning can be actually a very much a theological term for us. Because repentance that leads to faith. Repentance is a turning. It's a turning round. It's a 180 degree turn. A turning from self. To embrace all that the God who created us has for us. A conversion experience. To see there is something more special than just you and me. That there is something that God Almighty has for us. As he had for Moses. And just as when we turn to Christ and respond to what he has to say to us, this is what happened to Moses as well. When we go and embrace Christ freely offered to us in the gospel, two things come to mind. There are two great commandments, which is so much part of what Moses was going to be. He was to love God and hear what he had to say. And he was to go and serve someone else. Love God, love your neighbor. Isn't that the two great commandments? And they both Go hand in hand. It's not one or the other. It's both. And Moses, even though he hesitated a bit, discovered that that's how it would be. For a long time, it seems as Moses has been so self-concerned, he's running away from problems until this sight captured his attention. And it really took him out of himself and consequently made him aware of God and of a situation in which God really needed his help. When he looked, he heard... And God told him about the misery of his own people who needed help. And God gave him a new calling, a new perspective on life. The Christian life really is about a calling. Sometimes we think of ministers or elders or something like that. They are called, but we are all called. The Christian life is a calling. It's a God calling to us. A God calling to us so that we might turn and hear what he has to say and what he wants for us and from us. He says in Jeremiah 29, I know, and who else knows better? I know the future I have for you, says the Lord. Look and discover. In my experience, it's when my eyes don't turn to see, to see God, that uncertainty comes to my door. So Moses turned. But when he turned, he had to stop because he was amazed at what he saw and amazed at what he heard. And here's the lovely thing I think about this incident of Moses. God called him by name. Moses, 
Moses. It all changed for Moses when God called his name. God knew him. I think it's lovely. I know a boy who went, had to change school. From September to Christmas, he hated it. Just couldn't settle in. It was third year. But one day after Christmas, walking down the corridor, one of the teachers who he thought had no idea who he was said to him, Alec, how are you? He came home that night to his parents and said, you know, somebody knew who I was. And it was an interesting, because I know who that is. And it really changed their whole attitude to school, to their teachers, because somebody knew who he was. And it is good when somebody, someone remembers who we are and can call us by name when we meet. Now, when you get a maid, sometimes you forget names, but at least you know faces. Sometimes it's good when people call us by name. It says something about us, about the person we are, that we are caring enough to remember their name. God names Moses. Now, remember too, if you can go think back to when he was drawn out of the water with Pharaoh's daughter. The name Moses means to draw out, out of the water. Maybe to draw out for something new. And here God is calling him maybe again to say, Moses, your name means something. I've been watching and Pharaoh needs to be challenged. Was God reminding him of why he had been born? of why he had been drawn out of oblivion into a place of leadership, a place that would make him a great blessing to a whole nation. And calling him to be a blessing, God giving him a new life with a demanding work. Yet it was a life that was to be a blessing, not only to Moses, but to so many others. I think that's lovely too, because if you bring that into the New Testament, God calls your name and mine in Jesus Christ. And the lovely thing is as well, when he calls us and we respond, he tells us he writes our names indelibly in a book that will be opened one day. Our name's written in heaven. God knows who we are. He knows what's best. I think it's lovely when you think of it in those terms. He knows your name and he says to you, or to remind you that God so loved the world, that's you, Ivan, Mary, John, whoever you might be, that he gave something for you so that we might be blessed. But like Moses, and be a blessing. Moses was to bless his people by leading them out of slavery. Are you a blessing? I wonder. Sometimes we're so awkward and difficult. Crabbit, do you know that word? I think it was maybe more North Antrim than here, but some people, we can be so crabbed. We're not really a blessing to anyone. And it undermines who we might say we are if we are Christians. So here's Moses being called by name by the King of Kings. Wonderful. He stops, he turns, he's amazed, his shoes are off. And when, Moses, when God calls Moses, when he names him, he's immediately aware of his shoes. Because you don't stand in front of God with your shoes on. And Moses immediately feels unworthy. And to take off the shoes, I think, is to acknowledge who God is. It also speaks of Moses' own vulnerability and weakness. With your shoes off in a desert land, you'll get your feet jagged and all kinds of things. It speaks of weakness but of the one before whom we stand and his holiness. I don't think you feel good standing in front of someone in bare feet. It speaks of vulnerability, of your smallness. Remember the study in Newcastle sort of looked out onto the road and kids were always doing things like throwing eggs at the window because the light was on. And I remember one night as I was sitting in the study and I had no shoes on and they threw the eggs and I walked out and I followed them up the road. I'll not tell you what they said about me when they saw me following them, because it might, it's not uh, Presbyterian language. But I was in my bare feet, and I thought, goodness, this is so uncomfortable. And I had to turn and go back. I realized my own vulnerability, my own smallness. My wife said to me, you're crazy. They're bigger than you are. But for Moses, shoes off was about holy ground, because God was there. 
And I think one of the things that I maybe have lost, and I think the church has lost and Christian people have lost, a sense of God's otherness, God's holiness. We want this friend who will just entertain us so often. But we need to realize that we have a God who is holy, who demands certain things. And we need then metaphorically to take off our shoes and appreciate the ally we have in God and in his son, the Lord Jesus. If you know your catechism, I remember some of it from my youth, where it says, Catechism 11, God is holy, wise, powerful. That's the God that Moses was faced to. He stood before God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He stood in a place where Eugene Peterson talks about the neighborhood of the Trinity. Very special place where we bump into the Father, we meet the Son, and the Holy Spirit works in our lives. But not only does Moses take off his shoes in acknowledgement of who God is, he has to hide his face. There he stood with his shoes off in front of a bush that blazed on ground that trembled with the, of the glo- with the weight of the glory of God. And he couldn't look because he was afraid. Now Moses had known earlier what it was to be afraid. Remember how he'd been afraid before after he killed the Egyptian? He was afraid of Pharaoh and that's why he's on the run. But now he's afraid of God. That was good. Until he feared God more than he was afraid of Pharaoh, he would never be able to be a servant of the living God. A little wonder proverb says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, of acting wisely. Of course we know that God is a friend to all who trust him, but he's also a fiercely holy friend of whom we should be rightly afraid, not afraid in the sense that we're scared, but afraid in the sense that we give him glory. And realize who he is. We're respectful of God. We take off our shoes. It's been interesting these last while that sometimes on the radio there's been this debate about how we talk to God. Do we call him father? Do we call him mother? The Bible's quite clear that he's father. But he's something more than just how you name him. He is God Almighty. A God who cares about the world so much that he sent Jesus to cleanse sinners and to stand on the breach by way of the cross to bring us to God. Have you ever felt the need to hide your face before God? There's a young man in Newcastle who had a very tough life. I used to take him out and we had lunch together. But after a, a, an hour, I would say to him, Carl, I can't take any more. But let me tell you, he, he was gloriously converted. Now he had lots of rough corners still that needed to be sorted out. But he said this one night, and one morning in a prayer meeting in church. He says, God, I am no longer afraid to die. But you know, I'll be embarrassed when I meet you. He didn't need to be embarrassed because his sins were forgiven. But you know the sentiment that was there? He realized that it was before a holy God. It's a great place to be. That we're not just depending on a friend. We're depending on the God who made the whole earth and who keeps it going. Sometimes we need to stand before God, confess that we need to hide our faces because we treat him sometimes not in the way we should. Only when we fear him Will that set our lives aright as it would for Moses, afraid of God? But empowered by God, he didn't need to fear Pharaoh any longer. He set priorities as he hid his face. Of course, then, Moses, this is the fifth point. Moses hears the call, but then he begins to make excuses. And we all can make excuses. If I go, he says, they won't believe me. Who am I? What will I talk about when they say to me, who sent you? Why are you here? I'm not eloquent. I get tongue-tied. Look, you need to send someone else. We're told that Moses was slow of speech. That's how it's put. But it didn't take him long to find the words, I can't talk well. 
God says to him, remember Moses, Aaron is there. You're not alone. We're all in this together. I know at the moment congregational activities are on hold for the holidays. But before you know it, and it's nearly here, it'll be September and a new church year. Will you turn aside and rise to the challenges we have here in Antrim in Greystone Road? To do what you can. Rather than to say, I can't do anything. You know what the Lord says? A cup of water given in my name. It's important. So we all have something to offer. We don't all have to preach. But God calls us just to be those who show his love and grace in all that we do. God says to us, let us hold resolutely to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we can spur spur one another on to love and to good deeds. Because faith is about hearing and obeying. Church is a community. It's not individuals in their own corners. God calls each of us to bring what little we have. The two little coins that the woman brought was so well received by God. And of course, at the end of the thing, at the end of the event, Moses does go, he commits. He's seen, he's heard, he's turned, he's been confronted. And I'm sure as God's person, Moses was very apprehensive. It was a big task. Go to Pharaoh, go to King Charles and tell him something. And then God reassuringly says, and these are lovely words as well. He says, Moses, I will be with you. And he gives him this name, I am who I am. It's a verb to be. It's about presence. It's just about future. It's about everything. God will be with you. It's a promise not only to Moses, but to me and to you. I think it's good to remember that we're not on the journey alone. And the God who accompanies us, in the words of the shorter catechism, as I've already said, is holy, he's wise, he's powerful. He governs all things. Imagine working with God right here with you where we are in Antrim. I think society was never more in need of hearing good news. But not only of hearing good news, which is one of the dangers sometimes, we just say it, he needs to see good news. I think society more and more needs to turn aside and to see God. And how are they going to see God? Only when God's people make him known. When they see God's people and the church burning with holy fire, the world is in a mess. Society needs if it's ever going to get itself sorted out, to acknowledge who God is, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Society needs to turn or be confronted so that they turn aside to see God. See God's people in the church burning with holy fire. The world needs to see. Look at the world in which you live, maybe even your own life. There's economic deprivation, there's financial worries, there's political uncertainty. There's so much. What's going to happen with Ukraine and Russia? How will that affect petrol prices? There's so much that fears, causes us to fear. And what we hear of our world today as we look around, I don't think. There's some great things, but they're not always great stories. And like Moses, God is calling his church, that's you and me, to go. To be the storytellers through our words and actions of a hope that the world cannot give through authentic Christian living. Lives filled with the fruits of the Spirit. We, we love our, our, our diets, good diets these days, and we need to eat so much of this and so much of that. But here's a spiritual diet. The fruits of the Spirit of love and joy and peace and forbearance and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Do you get them all? I don't think I do. <laughs> But here are the fruits of the Spirit that should be developed in our lives so that not only do we show that we have embraced Christ as Savior and Lord, but they want to live for him. We've woven these fruits into our daily walk. A great story I love in Mark 14. 
Remember the story where Mary, uh, Mary pours the ointment over uh, Jesus' head. Somebody has a waste. Why is she doing that? But Jesus says, she has done a beautiful thing. Are you in the way of doing beautiful things? Society needs to see God's people being beautiful in the sense that in Christ we are different people. And every congregation, every society needs people who model Jesus. Don't you meet some people and you just know that they are full of God's love? And what opportunities you will have in the future here, I have no idea. But are we going to be part of a new thing that God may want to do here, Antrim or whatever? Jeremiah in 29 reminds us of this. Seek the peace and welfare of the city or the town where I have sent you. And pray for the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. If Andrew's doing well, you'll be doing well. Jeremiah says it. I remember reading a story a long time ago. I often repeat it because I think it's still relevant. Mary was a young woman who had lost her way. She had been a church attender. She'd been to youth fellowship and all the rest of it. It's a true story. Eventually, she stopped attending church for she said she had been deceived by inauthentic Christians, Christians who said one thing and lived another way. She really had a rough life. She went into all kinds of things that we don't need to talk about. But one day, she found her way back to church, and she wrote to her minister. Here's some of the words she wrote. It's kind of a poem. Do you know that you represent Christ to me? If you care, I think maybe he cares. And then there's this flame of hope that burns within me, and I don't want it to go out. You represent Christ to me. That congregation did care. And Mary came back and found new life in Christ. We do need to make sure we turn aside to see what God is calling us to do, that we will be people who look beyond the immediate or ourselves to bring hope to a struggling world. It may just be that cup of water. It doesn't need to be anything more. God called Moses and he calls each of us. We need to turn aside and take off our shoes before we then put them on again and go and reach out and live out as his children. We turn to God. We stop to see who he is. He calls us by name. And in Christ, he loves us so that we might respond and embrace his love that forgives our sins. Because really, we need to hide our faces many times. Not just when we realize that we're sinners who need a savior. He calls us to not only love him, but to love our neighbor. So there can be excuses. He just commits us. And the neighbor may not be the one next door. He may be beside you in church. I don't know. God calls us to commit, to care, and to show the difference that he has made in our lives. So let us pray. Almighty God, we just give thanks for the folks here this morning. Things are never done by mistake. You call us, you bring us here. Help us to appreciate that you never take your eye off us. Even when we're deaf and when we don't turn to see. Even when we turn our, close our ears to hear. And don't respond in faith to what you offer us in Christ. Or when we are called to do something and we say, Ah, let someone else. Father, you did not send someone else. You sent your son and we give you thanks for that. We thank you for the salvation that many have found in Christ. And we pray for those who have not come there, that they may find that same peace and forgiveness and salvation even today. But remind us above all else, Father, that we stand before you, a God that's high and holy and lifted up, yet comes alongside us to make life what it should be, life that is full Thank you for your presence. 
Thank you for all that has reminded us of your love, our songs that we've sung, your word, our prayers. And as we close and as we sing together, Father, we just ask that all the glory and the honor and the praise will be to you as it brings a blessing to our own souls. We pray and offer our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close, we're going to sing a hymn that speaks about God's promises, every promise. Let's stand and sing together. say thank you to, to Sharon. I sent her what I was going to talk about and I think she's chosen good hymns, so thank you very much. Let's bless one another as we say together the grace. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>